So welcome back, everyone. I got a special treat for the holiday season. Got author John Miller. He sold over a million and a half copies of all of his books. Uh, the most notable one is QBQ. He's got Flip the Switch or Flipping the Switch. And he's also a professional speaker. And great to have John on. Now, I was I was curious, what was the story behind QBQ? BQ. What was like some sort of action that happened in your life that was like, yo, some this is a problem that needs to be addressed to people in the world? Sure. Well, the problem is a lack of personal accountability in the world. But of course, that problem always starts with me. Quick history about me, Josh, and thanks for having me on. I came out of Cornell University many years ago and uh, joined the corporate world and started working a desk job eight to five. And after five years, I learned that wasn't for me. And I found a career in Minneapolis, St. Paul, selling management training, leadership training. And then I started facilitating training sessions. And I was only 27, 28 years old when I started, but got pretty good at it, sold a lot of training, did that for almost a decade and sitting in these sessions, I would listen to people, human beings like me, complain and point fingers and whine and maybe play the victim. And one day I realized we tend to ask lousy questions like, uh, you know, why do we have to go through all this change? And when is that department going to do its job right? And I turned it around and I said, why don't we ask the question behind the question? Instead of uh, why do we have to go through all this change? Let's ask, how can I adapt to the changing world? Instead of asking, you know, when is that department going to do its job right? Let's ask, what can I do to be my best today? And so, uh, you know, that's what started the journey. And I called it the question behind the question. And I went off and started teaching it on my own to small groups. And then those groups grew in size. And here we are years later, and I'm still out speaking on personal accountability and the QBQ. That's the title of our session, so we can get into the details. And my daughter, Kristen, she's Almost 41 now, she does the same thing. 15 years now, she's crisscrossed the country talking about personal accountability. That's kind of fun to have a millennial doing that. Yeah, for sure. And how did how did you get your first gig? Because sometimes you could have a really good idea and a lot of people have good ideas. Yet finding that yes. first opportunity is always the hardest. That's really a, a great question because people see you out speaking and they go, oh, I want to do that. Well... Do you want a cold call? Do you want to call strangers? Do you want to every day sit down at your desk and figure out how you can reach another executive who's got a budget to hire a speaker? Are you really willing to go through that emotional pain? Uh, are you willing to get hung up on? <laughs> I've been hung up on. Uh, I think the reason it worked well for me is I um, actually was a salesperson first, Josh. Then I became a speaker then I became an author, started writing my book. So having that foundation of knowing how to sell to executives, to corporations, made, a, made it a pretty easy transition for me to go from selling a training program to selling John Miller as the speaker. So, uh, you know, in October of 1995, I left my mentor, stopped selling his training program after a decade and, and called on people I knew. And all of a sudden I'm speaking at Wells Fargo Bank. In October of 95, that was my first official gig. And from there, we just, uh, I, it just kind of took off, partly because we just had the right message. I'm going to just close mm -hmm. my. So did you have a connection at Wells Fargo or was, yep. you yep. said you did a cold call with that? Well, in this case, like? I had a, I had a client I'd already worked with before. And so I got a hold of him and said, do you know of any meetings being set up? And, and he referred me to the right people. And the next thing I knew I was speaking to a couple hundred people in October of 95 in Minnetonka, Minnesota uh, at, for Wells Fargo. And, and then the real blessing was State Farm found me. I forgot how I got that first engagement with State Farm down in Texas and they gave me some leads. And next thing I knew I had 75 engagements with State Farm. Wow, and you were mentioning uh, cold calling. A lot of people don't like doing that. How did you uh, battle through those cold calls, especially uh, there's no software in the early 90s. You had to basically do everything manually back then. Uh, very astute. We had a, I had a book this big called the Minnesota Corporate Fact Book. And it was like a, a Bible, a real thick Bible. <laughs> and we'd flip through the pages. When I say we, I had a 
for a while while I was selling training, I had an associate in Minneapolis working with me. But we'd go through that fact book and we'd find, you know, the ABC company and it would list the VP of sales and and a phone number. And we'd sit at a desk with a landline and we'd dial that person up, try to get past the screen, you know, the receptionist uh, or the secretary, as they were called back then. And uh, we'd try to get a hold of them. And then we'd sell our way into an appointment. I mean, I made I had a lot of face to face appointments to go uh, talk to talk to people about me speaking at their event. And after a few years of doing that in the Twin Cities, uh, my career was kind of going national. All I needed was a good airport. No longer was my business based in Minneapolis. I was flying around the country speaking. So I said to my wife and four kids at the time, let's move to Denver. <laughs> let's let's get out of the Minnesota tundra. And so we did. And we came down to Colorado in late 97 and 26, 27 years later, here we are. Same house. And I'm still doing the same thing, except I have the daughter working with me. Perfect. And like, so you're building out this new business, speaking, corporate training, starting the right books. When you shifted from like corporate America to more of a entrepreneurial lifestyle, how did you... How did you figure out to determine your values starting out? Because sometimes that's hard for a lot of people is like, you know, I don't know what the charge or I don't, it's just like a whole new world out there. Right. I remember I actually sat down in, in early 95 with another professional speaker who I admired and he was older than I am. And I said, talk to him about fees. And he told me, well, you're brand new. I wouldn't charge more than X. Well, I thought, whoa, I've sold training programs for more than that. So I took his X and I doubled it and I charged twice X, two times X and Wells Fargo hired me and, and uh, the fees just start going up, you know, you I never forget around 2003 or four, cause we had by then seven kids. My wife said, could you, could you travel less, please? Could you stop traveling so much? And I said, sure, I'll raise my fee. Well, Josh, I raised my fee and the travel never changed. <laughs> you know, they'll tell you that if you, if you want to sell more, Actually, raise your prices. Don't cut your prices. Because <laughs> people, that, that's where the perceived value is. And of course, we were giving them a lot of value. But when I left the corporate world on salary, uh, I just started working out of my home. I remember people, Josh, in 1986 saying, oh, I could never work out of my home. And I thought, boy, that sounds like fun. You know, I can wear a flannel shirt. I don't have to wear a coat and tie to the office. I don't have anybody looking over my shoulder. I can be my own boss. And I was so hungry to succeed, Josh, making phone calls from my uh, furnace room in Minneapolis for those first few years as a speaker. It was just no big deal. It was easy peasy. And I was off and running. Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely have to go through a lot of. A lot of trials and tribulations to get through that point and basically like see a wall and not run to the wall, but run through the wall and like <laughs> yeah. making those calls and getting those contacts. Now you're doing the speaking that then led to the book or did the book become come before the speaking? Walk me through that, please. Question. Uh, the, the books, are, the content in, well, I, if you don't mind, the QBQ book yes. is a reflection, a reflection of my keynote speeches, my talks. Um, I started speaking in 95, 96. And of course, like most young speakers, uh, Josh, I was a little bit scattered speaking on too many things. You know, I'd, I'd say, oh, yeah, I can do the seven steps to trust building and I can do the nine characteristics of leadership. But what I learned in the first 18 months was what was what was really resonating with people was this message of personal accountability. I mm -hmm. mean, if you think back to that time in our country, we had a president being impeached. And since then, we've had a lot of stuff going on in the world. And uh, there's a lot of people who believe there's too much entitlement thinking out there, too much victim thinking. And so I just happened, I, I, I truly believe this. I came, came along at the right time to talk about personal responsibility, personal accountability. So I'd been out there speaking about a year or two and in Virginia at a State Farm event, two people ran up to me at a break and they said, this is really good stuff. You should put it into a book. And I remember saying, yeah, I know, I got to write the book. Every speaker has to have a book. Well, I wrote a book and it was called Personal Accountability, Powerful and Practical Ideas for You and Your Organization. And it was 300 pages. Everything I knew, 
And then about that time, Who, Who Moved My Cheese came out, a little book called Who Moved My Cheese. And everybody was reading Who Moved My Cheese, which took 22 minutes to read. And by, by uh, 2001, 2002, I finally understood. And I, I took my original book and we shortened it. We chopped it down to the QBQ book, which is about an hour read. And that's when it took off. And now we're in six, we've had six editions and we're in 25 languages and there's no need to change the content because personal accountability applies as much to, as much today as it did 20 years ago, maybe more. Yeah. I mean, whenever I like lose something simple, like my phone, I just say I'm responsible. And then I find it and I don't get like in a rut versus like, where's my phone? Who moved my phone? Where's my keys? Who moved Why my is keys? this happening to me? Why is this happening? Yeah, uh, I lose everything. And uh, I mean, when you're starting out, uh, it seems like you had a, I don't want to say like a a quick start, but it seems like you got off to a hot start. Like what was, was rewriting the book the biggest like aha moment for you or is it something else? You, um, It's a good, good analysis of my early speaking career because I had sold training for almost a decade. I just had a lot of connections. And this is the problem with people maybe who see a speaker and they go, oh, that looks like fun. And it is fun to be up on a stage and making them laugh and cry. And then they pay you. <laughs> they pay you for that, you know? And people who sit there in the audience say, oh, I want to do that. And again, I say, okay, you ready to make 50 phone calls a day? Are you ready to network? Are you ready to really ask for leads? Are you ready to get hung up on? And that's when they go, oh, I don't want to do that. I just want the gigs to come. Sorry, uh, I don't care how good you are. The phone doesn't ring. You have to make the phone ring. So I had the 10 years of relationships with executives in the Twin Cities and several of them. When I transitioned from selling training for my mentor to being an individual keynote speaker, they said, sure, John, we'll hire you. And uh, And then gradually... I broke away from that network and people started finding me around the country. Like just today, I got an email from a company that makes cranes, you know, the big cranes that tower over a city and build buildings. And they're having an event in Florida in January. And, and in our inquiry form, it asked, how'd you hear of us? And, and the guy said, Google speaker on personal accountability, John Miller popped up. And this morning I got an email saying you're hired. So the phone kind of rings now, but it didn't ring. <laughs> it did not ring 25 years ago. Yeah. And I mean, making calls and getting rejected is, it's like a rite of passage. Like you have to do it. It's like uh, going to the gym. Like, I don't know anyone that really likes working out their legs, but if you really want to like get in shape, you got to work out your legs and cold That's calling in business is something that um, it's a must have, you have to do it. Even if you get no results from it, you just have to do it. Cause it builds so much resiliency and you actually like learn a lot about yourself when you're doing it. Totally. But, uh, quick story. I started selling training in February of 86 by November of 86. I happened to have gone out of town from Minneapolis to do a rare out of town session that I, that I booked, came back on from California to Minnesota on a Sunday night, landed at 10 PM, got home at midnight, but because of my discipline, and I was a good prospector. I was up the next morning at 6 a.m. And by 7 a.m., I was at my desk and I was cold calling because, you know, you try to call early, get those executives before their assistants come in to answer their phone. And I remember maybe I got hung up on or I got turned down. And by 8 or 9 a.m., I can still picture this. I put my head down on my wooden desk in 1986, November, and I muttered to myself, oh, my gosh, this is hard. <laughs> <laughs> this is really hard work. And then I probably picked my head up off the desk and I made another phone call. It's it's not easy. And of course, nowadays it's different. You know, there's email and LinkedIn and all the different ways. I get messages on Instagram now. Don't, don't message me on Instagram. Email me. Come on. Email is still the best communication tool. John at QBQ.com. It's just not complicated. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so many ways to get a hold of people nowadays. It's, uh, it's almost too much. Yes. Um, it's almost too much. And I mean, myself, I'm, I've been doing some cold calls. I've been neglecting to do it. And I have like pennies on my desk. And every time I make a cold call, I move a penny. I put it in a little cup. And I'm like, I got to get all these pennies in the cup before the day's over. And good, just like, just power through it. I like it. Uh, 
Now with QBQ, the question before the question, it somewhat reminded me, I, this book came after yours, like in the lean startup when you asked like why four times. So it seems like your book was before that. What was like your question behind the question as you're going through these phone calls, as you're building the speaking business? Because obviously when you're going through 50 cold calls a day down in your uh, boiler room, sometimes uh, boiler room, <laughs> you can you can uh, get a little... Uh, you know, it's very um, humbling. Oh, uh, completely. Um, completely, yeah. Uh, the, the book you might be referencing, there was a book that came out that said, Start With Why. And uh, I don't know if that's the book, but it's just different concept than ours. What we teach in QBQ is to not ask why questions that sound like this. Why is this happening to me? Why don't I ever get a break? Why don't they do more for me? Why doesn't my wife, my husband, my friend, why why aren't they nicer to me? Why don't people understand me better? I mean, all of this is victim thinking, and that's how we use the why. Don't ask, why is this happening to me? Pity parties get us nowhere. And then we talk about how not to ask the when questions. Uh, when will the customer get back to me? When will I get more help? When will somebody support me more A on the job? You know, When will somebody clarify my role? Stop asking those when questions, because you're really saying, I'm not going to take action until Josh takes action. That's no good. And so that's procrastination. And then the third kind of questions we recommend you don't ask are the who questions. Who dropped the ball? Who made the mistake? Who missed the deadline? Those are blame questions, who done it questions. So what QBQ teaches is to get rid of victim thinking, procrastination, and blame. So it developed out of my own life experience. If I wanted to succeed selling training, I couldn't ask, why doesn't the customer call me back? I had to ask, what can I do today to reach the customer? Instead of asking, when will someone support me with more advertising and marketing, I needed to ask, how can I be more creative today? Instead of asking, you know, who did this? Who didn't do this? I needed to start asking, what can I do to move forward? How can I solve the problem? So in many ways, the QBQ came from my own experience of selling training. But Josh, it came from a lot of other things as well that just came together in my life. And the book's are a result of that. Life do you have like a do you have like a favorite question? Well, we do consider this to be the ultimate QBQ. Uh, how can I let go of what I can't control? Mm -hmm. See, the answers are in the questions. So if I ask a better question, I get a better answer. And so what we teach people is, okay, you can ask what can I do to serve and how can I be more effective today and, and what can I do to adapt to the changing world? But in the end, the, the final best ultimate QBQ is just to say, well, how can I let go of this? And most people spend a lot of their energy and time trying to fix stuff they can't fix, usually other people. Yes, uh, we can control what we can control and everything else. You just got to, uh, what, what's the phrase? The, the, the bull crap never ends. It just never <laughs> ends. It, it, so just accept it. Uh, hey, life can be hard. Yeah. And life is not fair. And that's just the way it is. And I can wallow in self-pity or I can get out today and make a difference. That's my choice. For sure. And you've been in the game for a while. What? And obviously a lot of things remain the same. What would you say from when you started this adventure to today, how, how have things adapted in the corporate marketplace or are they still somewhat the same what what are your thoughts on that interesting question because the people aspect has never changed i don't care about your technology i don't care about your new fancy titles that you have in the workplace now i don't care about what tools you have or don't have you still have people people who are human and they still at times feel like a victim they still feel entitled and want to hand out uh, they still want to point fingers when things go wrong to cover up their mistakes because embarrassment's a powerful, powerful emotion we all want to avoid. So the human thing, the human factor hasn't changed at all. Inside corporations, we still have people standing around saying, when are they going to give us the vision? Forget the vision, do your job. That hasn't changed in 30 years. So the human thing has never changed, Josh, and we have to actually make that point with our clients. We don't care how high tech you are, how fancy you are, how, how successful you are. Just this week, I spoke in Missouri to a life insurance firm that's privately held. And the owner started it. He's about a year older than I am. He started it in 83 at age 26. Now they have 500 employees. 
and they've been very successful. But as the president told me coming into the session, he still wants his people to realize no matter how successful we've been, there is room for personal growth. And so when I come in and teach QBQ, they may be expecting a business session and, and we give them all these tools they can use at work, but then they also get tools they can use at home with their spouse, their kids, their family situations. That's the big change, I'd say. When I was in Cargill, I worked for a big company called Cargill years ago. Business, family, separate. They, they just didn't, inter, they didn't intertwine. The twain shall not meet. <laughs> now, we all know you got people working out of their homes. You've got people leaving work to take care of their kids, pick their kids up from daycare. I mean, in, in 1980, Louisiana, when I was with Cargill in St. Louis, Missouri, and I had to ask permission to go pick up my daughter from childcare because the childcare worker was sick. And I just don't know if that still exists. But today, family, home life, work life, it's so intertwined. And that's the one difference I've seen in the business world. And that's probably a reason why QBQ resonates more than ever is because it is a holistic tool. It works in all areas of my life. And these people at work, they're still dealing with problems at home by text, by email, by phone. But anyway, the world's gotten a little messier, but I think that's been good for the QBQ message. Yeah, 100%. And that's awesome how your book has translated over such a long period of time and that people still can learn and adapt and grow and not play the victim by learning everything that you're, uh, I don't want to say preaching, but teaching. Actually, hey, my dad was a pastor. You can say preaching. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was also a Cornell wrestling coach. And he taught me a lot about, uh, you know, when I'm out on the mat, I'm, I'm all by myself. If I win or lose, no blame in the team. And we, we teach that concept now to businesses. No blame in the team. No hiding behind the team. Yep. When you fail, uh, the business the business leader definitely needs to uh, fall on the sword and lift the team up and figure out, like, hey, we're not doing as good as we need to. Uh, what can we do to to get back on track together, yep. not just good. individually? Right. And with that, uh, appreciate you coming on. Everyone check out the QBQ book if you haven't gotten it. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, everyone.